This is Super Hot Wingman, a prequel novella to The Best Men, written by Serena Bowen and Lauren Blakely, and performed by Teddy Hamilton and Jacob Morgan. Chapter 1. Red Flags. Mark. My first thought when my sister calls to tell me she met a totally great new guy is he better not break her heart like the last guy did. But I don't share that with her. Yet. I do the wise older brother thing instead. I ask all the right questions. And how did you meet him? I ask Hannah as I put away the suits I picked up from the cleaners earlier this evening. Was it at the pickling class you went to, or was it mayonnaise canning? Don't be silly. Mayonnaise is gross. It was at a candle-making workshop, she says. So I was close, I say, as I shut the closet in my bedroom and head to the living room, straightening up a farm puzzle my daughter left on the coffee table. I almost didn't go to it, which means it was kind of a moment when I met Flip. Hannah lives for moments. Let's hope this is a good thing. And are you going to see this guy again? She laughs, like she's never heard anything so silly as my question. Yes? Why is that funny? Well, she says, whispering the next words like a confession. I've already spent four days with him. The piece with the tail of a wooden cow falls from my hand with a clatter. What? But it's only Monday. More laughter comes from her. Yes, you've always been good at counting, Mark. That means I spent Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night with him. Every night, I ask, hackles raised. There is nothing worse for a relationship than rushing into it. That's a red flag. He's amazing, she says with a sigh. I know I should feel happy for her, but my radar is beeping. We both had Friday off, so we just spent the whole time together. Mark, I am completely serious when I tell you this. I think he's the one. I force myself to take a deep breath. Hannah. That seems really soon, I say, as I pick up the cow and set the barnyard animal cutout on the coffee table next to the pig. When you know, you know, she says, all breezy, like nothing can ruin her day. This man could, though. He could ruin many of her days, or her years. I don't want to see her get hurt, or make the same mistakes I've made. He treats you well, I ask carefully. Or am I going to have to rescue you like that time a few years ago when you were on a date and texted me in the middle of dinner to call and pretend your apartment flooded? She laughs. There will be no fake floods with Flip. But a fake flood would be preferable to what went down with the guy who broke her heart a year ago. Or what happened with Colin, I add. Mark, stop mentioning the ghosts of boyfriend's past. Flip is amazing. I promise you don't have to go all protective big brother on me. He's great, and I want you to meet him. I'm sure you'll give your full seal of approval. I'm not so sure about that, but we'll see. What are you thinking? Coffee or dinner in a couple weeks? I ask as I flop down on the couch, tired after another long day. Wall Street plus parenting will do that to a guy. As if I can wait that long. You get to meet him this weekend. I sit up straight. What's happening this weekend? We've decided that Saturday night will be game night, and you're going to be there, she pronounces. Oh, I am, am I? Yes, you and Flip's best friend. I'm claiming you as my Scrabble teammate, and you don't even have Rosie that night, so it'll be perfect, she says. Damn, she's good. How did you know I don't have Rosie then? I might have stopped by Bridget's wine shop to grab a bottle, and she mentioned it was her weekend. It works out perfectly, so you can't say no. I bristle at the mention of my soon-to-be ex-wife, even though I'm impressed by my sister's sleuthing. And if anyone should have what she wants, it's my little sister. Fine, I'll be there. What do I need to bring? Just that big brain of yours and your competitive spirit. I'll text you the address. Come over at eight. Flip and I will handle drinks and everything else. Although I should see if Asher wants to bring some of these incredible mackerel rolls he sent over to us last night from his favorite sushi place, 
which is now my favorite sushi place. They were melt-on-your-tongue-worthy rolls. What the hell is she talking about? Some other guy sent you mackerel rolls? Yes, Flip's BFF. You'll love him too, I'm sure. Whatever. I don't really care about some dude who's friends with my sister's new man, but this guy Flip? The man Hannah's suddenly over the moon for? My job is to check him out very carefully and make sure he's worthy of my baby sister. She waxes on for a good long while about Flip and how wonderful he is as I head to the kitchen and clean up the tomato and cheese sandwiches I made my kiddo for dinner. When Hannah hangs up, I check on my six-year-old. Rosie's sound asleep, and I press a soft kiss to her forehead, wondering briefly what you wear to a game night to meet the dude your sister is nuts for. Yep, this is my life. Separated single dad at the age of 27, and the most exciting thing I have to do is play party games with my sister's new friends. Yay me. Chapter 2 You Handsome Devil Mark On Saturday evening, I'm right on time to hunt for Flip's flaws. Besides the obvious one, his name is kind of ridiculous. And the other one, he lives on Park Avenue in a penthouse apartment that spans the entire 12th floor of the building. When I step off the elevator, I'm standing in the man's private foyer. A goddamn Degas sculpture stands opposite the coat rack. It's a brass one of the dancers. At best, our man Flip is a super rich art collector. At worst, he has a thing for skinny teenage ballet dancers. Newsflash. I don't trust this guy. It's not that I don't trust rich people. It's that I don't trust people. Especially people my sister seems enamored of. And she definitely is fond of the preppy, penthouse-owning, gray-eyed guy who struts into the entryway to shake my hand. I've heard so much about you, he says, his smile showing perfectly white, straight teeth. Nice to meet you. I manage and I give him a handshake that says, if you hurt her, I will disembowel you. At least I hope it says that. I looked this guy up on social media, and he's never been short of female companionship. Year after year, he has beautiful women by his side. I don't want Hannah to be one in a long line. She appears next to him a moment later, tackle-hugging me, nearly knocking my glasses off. This is amazing! My two favorite people have met! As I adjust my glasses, I feel a little nauseated, honestly. But now Flip is looking at her like he's already in love. This is pretty great, he says. Good thing Asher suggested I get a hand-carved jukebox at the place right next to the candle-making studio, or else I never would have tried the class and never would have met my amazing new girlfriend. Then Flip kisses her right in front of me. This is all too soon, and I want to grab my face and scream like the guy in that monk painting who calls someone his girlfriend after one weekend. Also, who needs a hand-carved jukebox? Who needs a fucking hand-carved anything? This is worse than I even feared. Twenty minutes later, I'm sitting on a giant burgundy sofa, sipping wine out of a glass the size of a fishbowl and trying to make small talk while Flip and my sister make lovey-dovey eyes at each other. What we aren't doing, though, is playing any board games, because we're waiting for this Asher guy to show up. Is he still coming tonight, or can we get started without him? I finally ask. I'm sure Ash will be here soon, Flip says then tells me how my sister convinced him to binge-watch Archibald Lane during their marathon weekend together. I figure if anyone can convince me to try period drama, I shouldn't let her get away. He drops a kiss to my sister's cheek. Don't you like that show, Mark? Hannah asks. Sure, I grunt. I don't go into detail, though, about the side story I liked best. The one where Lord Oliver and Sir Trevor stared longingly at each other from across the drawing room with gazes that said they wanted to rip off each other's waistcoats. I'm really looking forward to the spin-off series starring those two men. But that's not a topic I want to open up in front of Hannah's bow. And mercifully, the chime of the elevator announces another arrival. Flip springs up. That's Asher, he says. And wow, 
They must be BFFs for life if this guy doesn't even have to get buzzed up into a swank building like this. Flip heads to the door, and seconds later, two men are laughing in the hallway. You're late, Flip says. I know, I'm sorry, but here I am at last. Hide the liquor and the women, as they say. Except the women are safe with me. The newcomer rounds the corner. The first thing I notice is his hair. There's a lot of it, but then I get a look at his face. Holy crap, this guy is attractive. Like, cover of a magazine good looking. Doesn't that just figure? The rich playboy and his super hot wingman. My sister rushes to him. Hello, you handsome devil. Do you have a good excuse for being... She looks around to check the time. 27 minutes late, I say through clenched teeth since it's just rude to show up whenever you want. The attractive fucker looks at me then, tilting his head as if inspecting me. And God, he has beautiful hazel eyes. He makes me nervous somehow, which is stupid. My jaw ticks so hard it's in danger of cracking. Sorry, he says again. I was right on time, but you know that newspaper kiosk on the corner of 79th? There was a soaking wet puppy wedged between the times and the journal boxes. I almost walked right by, but she whined. A puppy? My sister squeaks. How does a puppy get left outside in New York City in December of all months? No idea. Asher shrugs. Is he putting us on right now? I rescued a puppy sounds like a close cousin to my dog ate my homework. Is Hannah really going to fall for that? Asher pulls a finely knit scarf out of his pocket. Is there somewhere I can hang this? The puppy was soaked. Oh, and here's a photo of her. Isn't she sweet? He pulls his phone out of another pocket and hands it to Hannah, who squeals again. Oh, those big, beautiful eyes. Shit, this man is good. 27 minutes late with an ironclad excuse and photographic evidence. Asher St. James. My sister hands the man his phone. This is my brother, Mark Banks, also known as the man who's going to destroy you on game night. Oh, is he? Asher steps forward wearing an attractive smirk. God, even his mouth is super sexy, with pouty lips. I look forward to the challenge. As I stand to shake, I'm about to agree. But when our hands clasp, the contact sends a sizzle to my central nervous system. The smack talk just dies in my throat. Get a grip, Banks, I order myself. The world is full of attractive men and women. There's no need to lose your cool. What game should we play first, honey? Flip asks my sister. No doubt you've already made a plan. You know it. She beams at him, and my terror notches up once again. Hannah is smitten. She's all in for Flip, the rich playboy prepster who has an unfairly hot friend. We're going to play Draw It Out as a warm-up. Then we'll move on to Scrabble. What's Draw It Out? Asher asks, tossing his coat on a chair. You have to draw whatever the card says, and the fastest team wins, my sister replies. No letters, no numbers, no talking. No tears. I snort out a laugh. My sister and I have always been fierce competitors. We're partners, right, Banana? Of course, the Bankses versus the men of Lyceum du Lucerne. Lyceum du Lucerne? I ask, glancing at Flip. That's where we met, at boarding school in Switzerland. We were paired as roommates from our first day, when we were 12, and that was it. Friends for life. A Swiss boarding school. Of course that's where they met. Sitting back down on the couch, I put my wine glass on a coffee table the size of a city block. Let's do this, I say, even more eager to match my Ohio public school wits against a couple of snobs. Right, Asher says, rolling up the cuffs of his shirt. Damn it. My eyes practically pop out of my head as he exposes muscular golden forearms. The guy is too hot for words. He can't even be real. But he's far too real as he sits next to me, making my whole body flash hot. Hannah, ladies first. You draw the first clue. Pass the woman the whiteboard. Maybe we get lucky on the first round. It only takes us 15 seconds of Hannah's drawing for me to spit out pizza sauce after scrutinizing my sister's circular artwork. 
Nice one. Flip marks down our time and gives Hannah a kiss. I look away. Then it's their turn, and I have to admit, they're a good team. Flip isn't an artist, but his skier is easy enough to discern, especially after he hashes out a mountain in the distance. Then he draws circles around the figure's eyes, and Asher blurts out, Ski goggles for the win. Wow, eight seconds, I say. You guys have a mind meld. This is Zermatt, right? Asher points at the peak in the corner of the drawing. You know it. The two high-five each other. I roll my eyes. Our next turn doesn't go as well, though. The card I choose reads, Vegetarian. Christ, what does a vegetarian look like? And go, Asher says. I hastily draw a face on the whiteboard with an open mouth. Um, okay, I will draw a vegetable. I try a turnip. Apple mouth, my sister yells. Bobbing for apples. With the side of my fist, I erase the turnip and draw a carrot instead, and then another carrot, and then a bunch of grapes, which take forever, and a banana. Monkey, hungry, fruit eater. Time's up, Flip calls. Vegetarian, I gasp. Hannah slaps her forehead. Oh. Is it just me? Flip asks. Or were you thinking, blowjob? Asher says, and the two of them burst into laughter while high-fiving each other again. Now I'm thinking about blowjobs. And Asher's wicked mouth. Shit. Your turn, boys, Hannah says sweetly. Let's see if you can do better. I say a modest prayer. Please, Lord, if you're going to make my sister Gaga over this player and his insanely sexy friend, at least please give them a difficult word. Asher takes the marker as Hannah readies the stopwatch. He picks a card from the deck, squints at it, and places it face down on the table. Ready? My sister prompts. And go! Asher begins to draw and... What the fuck? God. Really? Asher is clearly a damn artist. In the center of the board, he draws a perfectly articulated leg. A manly leg, where the calf muscle curves artfully beneath the knee. Then he draws an arrow to the shin. Moving to the left, he sketches a big flaccid penis. My sister hoots with laughter as he deftly adds the curve of a testicle at each side, just in case Flip can't identify a peen without the balls. Asher puts a plus sign between those two drawings. Penis plus shin? What? Then he moves to the right and draws a sort of messy cloud, at which point Flip yells, Dictionary! 29 seconds! Hannah cries. You're a fucking genius! Flip shouts. He and Asher embrace like they've just won the doubles tournament at Wimbledon, which, admittedly, they kind of did. Dick Shin Airy, my sister says. That really was a mind melt. When the boarding school wonder twins break their bro hug, the stupidly hot one winks at me. My chest heats up. I'm rattled by him. The word flustered takes on a whole new meaning since I have no idea how to behave around this Asher guy. This is going to be a long game night. Chapter 3. Nothing but a pair of blue briefs. Mark. My one-eyed cat is perched on the kitchen counter watching me hide grated cauliflower in the homemade mac and cheese when the buzzer rings. That'll be Hannah and my daughter. Most days, the babysitter picks up Rosie from kindergarten and spends a couple hours with her before I return from work. But a few times a month, my sister leaves work early and handles afternoon kid detail, which means Hannah spoils her niece rotten before depositing her home again. After buzzing them in, I quickly cover my masterpiece with enough shredded cheese to disguise the vegetables. Then I wrap it with foil. Don't tell her there's veggies in here, Blackbeard. I say to the cat. He looks away. I shove the dish in the oven to bake when Hannah's key clicks in the lock. Daddy! My little girl yells a moment later. What's for dinner? Hey, I chide as she tears into the kitchen, jacket and backpack still on. How about a nice hello before you start making demands? I bend down and scoop her up into my arms. When I kiss her chilly red cheeks, 
She smells suspiciously like chocolate. Hello, Daddy. I love you. And she melts my heart with three little words. She blinks at me with her mother's eyes. What's for dinner? Mac and cheese. The good kind? From a box? Hannah cracks up in the doorway, still bundled up from the cold January day. The good kind from scratch. Are you hungry already? Not really. I had snacks. Yummy snacks. My gaze flies to Hannah, who looks like she's been caught red-handed. Is that so? My sister shrugs, and her smile looks apologetic. I'd love to stay and chat about the delicious treats we just had at Dr. Insomnia's, but I have to get ready for a night out on the town. On Wednesday? I ask, as if it's illegal to enjoy yourself midweek. Although the concept is foreign to me. I don't get out much, even for coffee. Becoming a single parent has been a huge adjustment, especially since Rosie's with me most of the time while Bridget is busy. Hannah, on the other hand, parties like a rock star these days. Flip, whose real name it turns out is Philippe, pronounced the French way, is constantly whisking her off to Broadway shows, new restaurants, even the ballet. I'm starting to think the man really loves her. I mean, he sat through a three-hour production of Swan Lake. If that doesn't say smitten, what does? Still, I'm skeptical by nature, especially since all I hear is flip this and flip that. I've only seen the man once since the dreaded game night. A few weeks ago, I suffered politely through a brunch where I drank a Bellini and tried not to judge Flip for mentioning his family homes in both France and Aspen. Even if he does love her, he and Hannah are so obviously mismatched. I've been bracing myself for the day when she becomes another ex on his social feed, when he decides to move on from my sweet sister to a cold-blooded New York socialite. Like the day her last boyfriend showed her his true colors. She'd moved in with Colin after a year of dating and then learned the jackass had cheated on her. He'd begged her to stay with him, said it would never happen again. And when she said no way, he tried to hold all her stuff hostage. So I went to her place, grabbed her things, and she moved in with Bridget and me for a few weeks till she found her own place. I don't want to see her go through that kind of hurt again. But any day now, she'll tell me that she and Flip have broken up and that she's heartbroken. Today, however, is not that day. Where are you going tonight? I ask. To a benefit at the public library? It's a scavenger hunt. Flip and I love a good scavenger hunt. That sounds magnificent, I say, wishing I had a social life too. I haven't had a lot of that recently, thanks to Bridget. But I love all the extra time with my favorite person. She grins. Later, Marky Mark. Bye, Rosie. Bye, Aunt Hannah. My daughter closes the door on her aunt and then scurries back to the kitchen, dropping her backpack and shedding her jacket right on the floor. Rosie, where do those go? I remind her, but seriously. And you're supposed to put your lunchbox on the kitchen counter so it doesn't get stinky. Okay, Daddy, I will. But look, she pulls something small out of the front pocket of her bag. When she opens her fingers, she shows me a perfectly shiny little sphere marked like a black and white soccer ball. Is that a marble? I pick it up and test its smoothness between my fingers. It's beautiful, Rosie. Is it from that toy store you like? We didn't go to a store, Daddy. We went to the coffee shop, and Hannah's friend was there too. His name is Asher. Asher, I repeat stupidly as heat flares inconveniently along my skin. Blonde guy? With gorgeous hazel eyes and a face that could stop traffic? He bought cookies, Rosie says with obvious glee. Me and Hannah both had some, and he gave me this marble. He got it at a meeting for work. We talked about soccer, but he calls it football. She takes the marble from my hand and holds it up to the light. I told him my daddy has meetings too, but there aren't any toys at your work. Except that one time you let me play with the stapler. I hold back a sigh. Even my kid is enamored with Asher St. James. What is that guy's deal? Aunt Hannah says Asher is a photographer. My daughter pronounces the word with great care. But he used to play sports on TV. Well, that just fits him too well. Rosie tucks the marble into her pocket, and I make a mental note to keep those pants out of the washing machine. Can I play with my toys until dinner? She asks. 
after you put your lunchbox by the sink and hang up your coat, I insist. Okay, Daddy. My darling child finally does as asked, and she hugs me once more and disappears into her room. I sit down at the kitchen table and pick up my phone, and then I do something I've been trying not to do since game night. I Google Asher St. James, and I instantly regret it. The first photo is of him in soccer gear, his thigh muscles popping out over those tall socks the players wear. He's hoisting some kind of trophy into the air with muscular arms. But the second photo almost kills me. It's a photo shoot for Calvin Klein. A younger Asher reclines on a white divan in nothing but a pair of blue briefs and a Fashion Week pout. God damn, I want to lick my phone. How can anyone be so good looking and talented at the same time? I keep scrolling. There's an interview with Sports Illustrated and another one with Out Sports. His wiki tells me he was a striker on an English Premier League team. He has a degree from a European art school. There are more photos, more accolades, more golden skin, more six-pack abs. I'm lost down the rabbit hole of his soccer stats when the oven timer suddenly dings, startling me. I kill the browser window and slap my phone face down on the table. What the hell am I even doing? Asher is nothing to me. He's an irritating man I met once. That's all. I look up, jerking my head back when I find the cat on the table staring at me, judging me quietly. Don't tell a soul what I was doing. I hiss. He swishes his tail. He makes no promises. But so far, he's kept all my dirty secrets. Heaving myself out of my chair, I set down my glasses so they don't get steamed up, then open the oven and check on our dinner. This is what I should be doing, parenting, not staring slack-jawed at pictures of one of the sexiest men I've ever seen. Chapter 4 The Lust Zone Mark Six weeks later, my little sister is still going strong with Mr. Prep Bro. This will likely still burn out like a brush fire, and I'll be here for her when it does, like I have been the other times. Tonight, though, I have to put on my game face for her dinner party and act like I'm all good with her romance with a player. And, oh yeah, pretend I don't have a crush on a certain former soccer star. Because a grown man does not have a crush on his sister's boyfriend's hot best friend. That's ridiculous. Also, technically, it's not a crush. Asher St. James just happens to be the star of a recent dirty dream. That's all. On a Friday night in February, I enter Flip's monster pad, giving the side eye to the day god dancer, when Hannah greets me as if she hasn't seen me in years. I'm so glad you could come. You get to meet some of my new friends, she says, throwing her arms around me. My doubt made her ticks higher. His life has become her life. His friends are now her friends. How can this warp speed love affair last? Sounds great, I say when we separate, my game face in full force. I have to tell you something. She puts her hands on my shoulders and drops her voice. I think I'm going to move in officially in a couple weeks. My radar pings again, a loud warning. I've practically been living here already. Flip has only been asking me to move in since January. Wait, what? Does she not realize how fast this is? Did she forget what happened the last time she moved in with a guy? And this is so much sooner than Colin. January was only a month ago, I point out, as if she doesn't have access to a calendar. I know, crazy, right? I'll say. Do you think it's a good idea to move in that quickly? I ask out of the side of my mouth. Don't you remember? Marky Mark, she chides, wagging a finger. What did I tell you about protective big brother mode? It's just fast, I point out, in case she's forgotten how time works, especially bad boyfriend time. I'm in love with him. He's in love with me, she says as she sails into the dining room. Why would it be a bad idea? You know why, I say. But there's another reason too, a big one I've learned firsthand. When relationships level up too soon, they shatter causing collateral damage to a family. Please give it some time, I beg following her. 
She pats my shoulder. You don't have to worry about me. Here's what you can do, though. Sure, I say, eager to help. Maybe I should run a background check on Mr. Monopoly, for instance. If you know anyone at your bank who might want to sublease my cute little studio apartment in the village, let me know. On that note, she breezes into the kitchen, where Flip wraps an arm around her waist and drops a kiss to her cheek. They look too perfect. That's the trouble. If something is too good to be true, it usually is. But there's no time to dwell on Flip, since the elevator doors chime once again, and I tense. I just know it's going to be him. I am here, so now we can begin, Asher says his too sexy, too rumbly voice floating through the apartment, coasting down my back and making my skin prickle. Whoever invented the idea of lust is pissing me off, but it's poker face time. As Asher joins the crew, I focus on the other guests in the kitchen, making small talk with Oscar and Felicity, a pair of Brits who are here from Paris, and Archie and Danya from a few blocks away. They ask if I know some dude at some hedge fund and some other dude at a private equity firm. I act interested in flipping through my Wall Street Rolodex since it helps me avoid the guy several feet away who turns me on and frustrates me at the same damn time. Once it's time for dinner, Hannah shows me to my chair at the dining room table, right next to Asher. That's not gonna fly. I scan my brain for a good excuse to sit someplace else when my phone rings. Hannah gives me a look that translates to, turn your phone off at dinner. But I grab it from my pocket and waggle it at her. Rosie's calling to say goodnight, I explain, then slip into the living room, relieved to get away from the object of my inconvenient desire. Rosie and I chat about her day at school, then I say goodnight. Love you, cupcake, I tell her. Love you too, daddy, she says as a fork clinks on a glass from the dining room. I hang up the phone and prepare to enter the lust zone once more. Chapter 5 Standing Would Be a Bad Idea Mark As I head toward the dining room, the conversation grows louder. Asher, if you're going to make one of your epic toasts, may it not take an hour this time? Danya says with a laugh. We've got to get home to our sitter by ten, tick-tock. And how is my adorable little Elizabeth Ann the second doing? Asher asks. Such a darling. We love her so much, Danya says. Thank you again. Why is she thanking him for her kid? Here's to shivering puppies in newspaper kiosks finding their forever homes, Asher says. Apparently I'm a dog matchmaker now, too. Are you kidding me? Elizabeth Ann is a dog and Asher both saved her and found her a home? Can't he just be hot? Nope, he's hot, and cocky, and he's a dog superhero. Fuck you, Lust. As I enter the dining room, Asher clinks his glass to Danya's. Mark, isn't this amazing? Asher found a home for Elizabeth, the shivering border collie. Hannah calls out. Amazing, should have named her Dictionary. I say, turning to Hannah and plastering on a smile as I walk straight into Asher's outstretched arm, the one that's holding his glass, and the drink goes upside down all over me. Great. Just great. Now I'm wearing his champagne on my chest. I stare down at my navy polo soaked through with expensive bubbly. Oh, fuck. 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 I'm so sorry, Asher says. It's fine, I mutter. Mark, I can get you a fresh shirt, Flip calls out. Yeah, that'd be a no, but I don't have time to politely decline since Asher says, Here, let me help. How does he plan to help? I look up. Wait, nope, not that. That is not helpful. This can't be happening. No way is he taking off his shirt in front of all of us. In front of me. There. No need for you to wear a soaked shirt all night when that was my fault, Mark, Asher says. I'm fine, I blurt out, because his shirtlessness must stop. I can't handle it. It's possible Danya is laughing. Hannah might be catcalling. Flip is shouting something about Magic Mike. And I do nothing, because the guy standing next to me undoes the last button on his tight designer shirt, exposing all of that smooth skin 
flecked with chest hair that I want to run my hands through. My mouth waters. And I officially hate lust right now. Clenching my fists, I fight the overwhelming urge to rip that shirt off him the rest of the way, explore that unreal six-pack. Wait, is that an eight-pack? My eyes dart briefly, taking in the details of those muscles as I sit down. Standing any longer would be a very bad idea. Asher strips off the shirt completely, then hands it to me. Here you go. Not sure I can speak right now, but at this point the only thing I have left is my dignity, so I wave off the clothes. I'm fine. When Asher sits next to me, still shirtless, he spreads a napkin across his lap and shoots me a cocky grin. Yeah. You already said that, Banks, he says, then returns his focus to the dinner party, telling a story about a photo shoot in Paris. I settle in for a long, painful meal in my champagne-soaked shirt. In spite of my warnings, Hannah moves in with Flip a few weeks later. This is awful news. On the phone, walking home from work, I plead with her to be careful. She just laughs. It's all good, but I do want to come see you on Saturday. Do you have Rosie? Of course, I say, since I usually do. On Saturday, Hannah comes over for dinner and bath time, then insists on reading ten books. Rosie's in heaven, and still begs for more. Hannah tucks her in after the eleventh. Good night, sweet girl, my sister says. I give Rosie a good night kiss, then we leave, shutting her door. Are you thinking about taking up a new career as a nanny? I tease. Hannah shakes her head and bites her lip as if she's hiding a smile. She tugs me to the kitchen, yanking me there in seconds flat. That's going to be me soon, she says, pointing at Rosie's room. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I can add up what she said, but it feels like a complex math equation. I've got to get it just right. Explain. Hannah sets her hands on my shoulders and squeezes hard. I'm pregnant. We're due in the fall. I'm so happy. Tears of joy roll down her face as she throws her arms around me. But me? I'm numb. I feel like I've slipped back in time to when I last heard those words, when I got my college girlfriend pregnant. Honestly, I feel like screaming. This thing with Flip is moving way too fast. My sister could get hurt, and her kid, too. But wow, a baby. A tiny Hannah. My heart squeezes. Just the idea makes my throat feel tight. My little sister is going to be a mom? That's incredible. Wonderful, and also terrifying. Rosie's newborn days were so hard, but so amazing. And so hard. This is a lot. Hannah is still waiting for me to say something nice, but my throat is made of ground glass. Congratulations. I choke out, trying to sound convincing. This news moves me in a hundred ways, but I can't shake the feeling that she's heading down the same road I just traveled. I know how stories like this end. I'm living the end of this tale, and it ain't pretty. Chapter 6 The Hot Nerd Vibe Asher As we head to the tennis courts on a gorgeous May morning, I clap my good friend on the shoulder. I only have one question for you today, I say to Flip. Is this where you ask me again how on earth I convinced Hannah to marry me? The man simply can't stop talking about the whole she said yes moment since he asked Hannah to be his wife a week ago. He even showed me her Instagram post where, in fact, she wrote, I said yes. Side note, I was the first to know her answer because I was the engagement photographer. Felt a little like James Bond, waiting patiently behind a tree in Central Park, then popping out to snap photos when Flip went down on one knee on Bethesda Terrace. No, question is, I say, swiveling the racket in my hand as we walk to the courts in the park. Are you going to need a handicap since I plan on utterly destroying you today? Flip scoffs. I never need you to spot me any points, and I have beaten you on occasion. Just because you played some god-awful sport nobody's ever heard of doesn't mean you win all the time at everything. But I usually do. I clutch my chest like I've been wounded. Some sport nobody's heard of? Try the best sport in the world. Flip laughs. You wish. But back to that other thing, he says as we enter the court. 
We're thinking for obvious reasons of having the wedding pretty quickly. And Hannah had this idea about where to throw it, but I might need a little help from you. I'm listening. Then Flip details his plan and I give an approving nod. Impressed. I love that city. I know a few people there. Why don't I make some calls? I can't believe I'm saying this, but you're the fucking best, Flip says. I smirk. I know. You're a cocky bastard and don't ever change. I won't, I say as we reach a bench at the edge of the court. I set my phone on the wooden slats. So will the wedding be the first time you meet her parents? They're going to love you. Flip blows on his fingernails as he sits. Parents adore me. They always have. You do have all the parent charm. Besides, what family wouldn't be thrilled to have you in it? That is true, except, he says, a line creasing his brow as he tightens the laces on his sneakers. I get this odd feeling sometimes about Hannah's brother. My ears perk up since I get a feeling every now and then when I think of Hannah's brother, too. But I'm not going to tell anyone exactly what that feeling is. What do you mean? Sometimes I get a vibe that he doesn't like me, Flip says, like that's the oddest thing ever. And it fucking is. Why on earth would Mark not like his sister's fiance? What reason could he possibly have for that? No idea. That's what's so weird. But you've met him a couple times. The dude is impossible to read. Flip stands and grabs a tennis ball. You're not wrong there, I say, since I can't figure out what Mark's deal is when it comes to me either. I annoy him, and I don't know why. Except, why do I even care? Well, besides the obvious, Mark is a smoke show with that clean-cut look, that short, dark hair, and those midnight blue eyes, plus the glasses, Banks can work the hot nerd vibe hard. But I make a point not to crush on straight guys. Besides, he's barely said more than a few words to me. What do you think? Flip asks. I was daydreaming about the sexy nerd single dad banker again, and that's not something I like to do when it comes to men who don't even play on my team. Don't worry about that guy, I say to Flip. I'm sure Mark approves you'll be the best brother-in-law ever. I point to the court. Now, prepare to regret the fact that you didn't take the advantage I offered, and you can take back everything you said about football when I win. I proceed to begin his destruction on the court. Only once between games does my mind drift back to Mark Banks. Too bad he's not queer. Shame, that. A couple hours later, Flip eats his words. You're right, football is great he says grudgingly as we stroll off the court. It is, and I forgive you for saying those terrible things. In fact, to show you how much I forgive you, I decided we need to celebrate your engagement. I want to throw a little party tomorrow night, I say as I snag a towel from the bench and wipe the sweat from my neck. Flip's eyes twinkle with delight. I love a good party. Tell me something I don't know. I grab my phone and fire off a quick message to a manager at the sushi restaurant Flip and Hannah love, the one with the mackerel rolls. I'll take care of the whole thing as a gift to the two of you. Flip grins. You're right. How could anybody not like either one of us? It's mystifying to me, I say. Speaking of, one of my clients who adores my work gave me some Cubans. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? That we need to smoke them tonight to celebrate my engagement and my impending fatherhood? Fatherhood. Damn, I'm a little shaken up by his whirlwind engagement. The speed at which my best friend's world is changing makes my head spin. But it's his life and I support him. These big events are cause for celebration. It's settled, I announce. I'll be on your terrace this evening to light up and celebrate. Hey, give me Hannah and Mark's phone numbers. I'll need to make sure they're available for the party tomorrow. Thanks, man. Flip slaps me on the back. I really appreciate this gesture. My pleasure. The party is going to be great. I just know it. Chapter 7. Shotgun Wedding. Mark. Another? The bartender asks, and I hesitate, checking my coworker's face. Sure, Brett says, but I'll switch to light beer. I order another rum and tonic because, unlike Brett, I don't have a wife or any significant other, for that matter, at home waiting for me. Rosie is with Bridget, so the only one who's hoping I come home tonight is an antisocial cat. Hell, Blackbeard won't even notice my absence until breakfast. Brett noodles with the chessboard that's set up on the bar between us. Did you hear Hartman is pissed because we both scheduled our mandatory time away before he could pick a date? He asks. I snicker. He who snoozes loses, 
Exactly. God bless MTA. Brett holds up the dregs of his old drink and we clink glasses to our required two weeks off. Did you make a plan yet? He asks, because my mandatory vacation is coming up fast. Well, no and yes. Last time, I flew my family to Michigan, where we rented a cottage on a sandy beach. My parents drove up for a few days to spend time with us. But this time, I've been at a loss for what to do with myself for two lonely weeks. Until Hannah suddenly sprang her engagement on me. My sister just announced she's having a shotgun wedding, so she'll be throwing something together during my break. Brett lets out a low whistle. They're tying the knot that quickly, huh? Yep. I swallow roughly. Wow. The bartender plonks down our fresh drinks. We thank him. Then Brett takes a sip of his beer and studies me over the rim of his glass. This isn't sitting well with you, is it? The baby? The marriage? All of it. I'm struggling, I admit. Why? Is the guy a deadbeat? Is he unemployed? I let out a bitter laugh. No, he's richer than God. Like old money rich. Went to boarding school in Switzerland for fuck's sake. Interesting. Is he a snob? Is that the issue? Well, sometimes he does sound like a rich bro. For no good reason, a quick mental image of Flip's longtime friend pops into my head. That dude's been visiting my head far too often, so I shove the image of Asher St. James aside, although I bet it's unusual for a rich prepster to have a gay best friend. Honestly, it wouldn't be fair to say that Flip is some kind of dreadful cliché. It's nothing specific I can put my finger on, I admit. Except for the fact that he doesn't know how to operate a condom, Brett quips. Well, yeah. Then again, I got Bridget pregnant before graduation, so Flip and I have more in common than I'd like to admit. Maybe that's the problem. Ugh. I just don't want her to get her heart broken, and I've seen it happen. The truth is that I just have a gut feeling that my sister is making a huge mistake. And you're supposed to trust your gut, right? Right, Brett agrees. Although, it's her life. What could you really do about this except show up in a tux with a gift? Not much. I've spent the last few nights stewing over this very question. I love Hannah so much that it hurts. I never want to see her divorced and bitter like me. And I can't shake the feeling that she's headed that way. She had a really terrible boyfriend a year ago. This guy Colin. The breakup was awful. I just hope we don't end up there again. Is this flip guy anything like her ex? Brett asks. Do you see a pattern? Not exactly, I grumble. The truth is, Flip and Colin are nothing alike. But I'm still wary. I'm still seriously worried for her. I'd do anything for Hannah. I'd fight anyone who got in her way. I'd scale any mountain. There has to be something I can do. I take a deep drink of rum instead, then finish it off and move my night on the chessboard, a game I can control. Soon, Brett pushes away from the bar. Gotta go, bud. I'm sure you'll figure something out. And if you don't, there's always poker next week to take your mind off it. I offer a faint smile. Yep. Catch you tomorrow. He leaves, but I stay and order a glass of scotch. And another. And I think, and think, and then think some more. And the scotch really helps clarify all my thoughts. A few drinks later, and I've totally fucking got it. There is no problem a single malt scotch can't solve. This is so brilliant, it's beyond brilliant. And I'm going to fix this now as soon as I get inside my apartment. But first, I've just got to unlock this persnickety door. It's never been this hard to open. What the hell, Locke? I mutter. I fumble with my key trying once, twice, three times to let myself in. There! Did it! I am the master at opening doors, just like I am an expert at solving problems. And I know how to repair this little shotgun wedding situation. You speak up. As in, speak now or forever hold your peace. I toss my keys on the entryway table and they skid to the floor with a loud clang. Oops. Whatever, I'll pick them up tomorrow. Because I am ready for business tonight. It might be past midnight, but that's when the best decisions are made. Blackbeard, I call out to my cat, who's sound asleep on the couch. We've got shit to do, stat buddy. 
The furry dude deigns to lift his head, then turns the other way. Fine, be like that. I'll be my own wingman. I flop next to the feline, setting my wing tips on the coffee table, even though that's against my rules. No shoes on the furniture. But who cares? I'm the only one who makes the rules in this home now, and I can put my goddamn feet wherever I want, and I can speak my mind. And isn't that what we're supposed to do in life? Don't let stuff fester and all. I crack my knuckles, then grab my phone, ready to tell my sister exactly what she needs to hear. This brilliant insight is going to be so helpful for Hannah. Hell, she'll be damn grateful. Protective Big Brother is here to save the day. So I do it. I fire off a text to Hannah. Yep, that's clear. Except, maybe I need to send just one more. And while I'm at it, how about another? And another. And another. And another. And find just a few more. And while I'm at it, there's one little thing I've been meaning to tell her about Asher St. James. Then I toss the phone on the table. That was seriously fucking awesome advice I dispensed. Everything will be sorted out by morning, and she'll see what a good brother I was. Tonight. Epilogue. Past his bedtime. Asher. The smoke curls into the late-night Manhattan air as we lean against the terrace, the whole city spread out below us. To new beginnings for you, I say, as I hold the cigar like I'm toasting with it. Flip blows out a puff, making perfect circles. You're not going to do one of your epic long toasts? I laugh. I don't do epic long toasts. I reserve my stamina for other things, thank you very much. Flip laughs, then sighs happily. Life is good, Asher. And I hope you know I'm not going to be one of those guys who checks out on his buds when he has a kid. I smile. I know that. I plan on being a great father and the best husband ever. I love Hannah madly, and I'm so fucking excited about the baby, he says, and nearly chokes up again. But you know, life is big. There's room for all sorts of stuff. I cuff him on the arm. I get your meaning, but let's save the sentimental shit for another time. I say as a familiar ping hits the air. Our phones buzz at the same time. And buzz and buzz. I reach into my back pocket for mine. Flip grabs his too. When I swipe open the screen, I click over to my text messages. There's a new one from Mark on the group thread for the party tomorrow. It's Mark. Isn't it past his bedtime? Whoa, burn, Flip says with a laugh. Then again, it is 1245. I click open the chat and read the first message. My jaw comes unhinged. Holy fucking shit. Pretty sure he only meant to send these to his sister. Glance over at my friend, registering the shock on his face too. I cannot believe Mark Banks just said that. And that. And that. And whoa, that last thing. About me. Our phones go silent as the string of texts ends. And I know one thing with absolute certainty. The party I'm throwing tomorrow just got a lot more interesting. Epilogue. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Mark. The sound of my alarm is very soft today. Almost so soft that I can't hear it. Wait. Prying my eyes open, the first thing I see is Blackbeard on the coffee table. He's staring at me with judgment in his one eye. Uh-oh. I lift my head off the arm of the sofa. A shooting pain runs from my aching neck to my shoulder. I spent the whole night on my couch? What the hell? As I swing my body into a vertical position, my empty stomach gives a sickening lurch. Ah, oh, boy. I'm not much of a drinker, usually. I only drink when I'm out with friends. But Brett and I were playing chess at the bar, and instead of switching to beer, I turned to rum and tonics. Wait, scotch too. I switched to single malt. A lot of single malt. Shit, I better find some aspirin. And I better shut off my alarm, which is still trilling in the bedroom. I grab my glasses from the table and put them on, then stand up slowly. Something clatters to the floor. It's my phone. Huh. I bend carefully to retrieve it because everything hurts and I want to die. The phone wakes up and glows brightly right in my eyes. Ouch. 
Everything is ouch. Lifting my thumb to shutter the phone, I catch a glimpse of the text string on the screen. They're all in shouty caps. Lots of them. A long tirade. Authored by me. To Hannah. Oh, shit. The memory of my intention comes flooding back, and everything that seemed like a good idea late last night has turned out to be a horrible idea in the light of the day. I only wanted to warn her. I just wanted to dispense some brotherly advice. But drunk brothers aren't nearly as smart as they think they are. Frantically, I scroll up through my rantings. And it's bad. Like awful advice delivered thoughtlessly. This is... Wow. I lost it last night. I owe Hannah a huge apology. But when I finally reach the top of my drunken rant, it gets even worse. This is a whole new level of mortification because Hannah wasn't the only one I'd texted. I hit reply to Hannah's last message in the group chat where Asher invited me to the engagement party. Kill me now. I groan so loudly that Blackbeard leaps off the coffee table with a wake the dead meow. Yeah, I say, my voice cracking with disuse. This is bad. He looks up at me and mules again but not in sympathy. He only wants his breakfast. So I stagger toward the kitchen, knowing that Blackbeard will be the only one happy to see me today. I am officially the worst brother ever. And the cherry on top of this shit Sunday? I still have to go to that party. But I'll do it. For Hannah. Even though the last thing in the whole world I want to do is see my sister, her groom, and his super hot best friend tonight. Dying to know what the drunk texts said? How the hell Mark handles the party? And what happens next with these two hot men? Find out in the full-length novel, The Best Men, performed by Teddy Hamilton and Jacob Morgan, and available in audio. This has been Super Hot Wingman, a prequel novella to The Best Men written by Serena Bowen and Lauren Blakely, and performed by Teddy Hamilton and Jacob Morgan. Produced by Tyler Whitlatch at Plunk Productions. Casting by Lauren Blakely and Serena Bowen. Story and production copyright 2022 by Serena Bowen and Lauren Blakely.